Welcome to the Association 4.0 podcast, your association's no-fluff playbook to navigating and thriving in Industry 4.0 or the digital marketplace. Each week, we bring expert insights to help you and your association stay ahead of the curve. Hello, my name is Sherry Budziak, and I'm the host of the Association 4.0 podcast. I'm also founder of .org Community and the CEO of .org Source, a consultancy to associations. Today, my guest is Jennifer Mahalik. Jennifer is Assistant Executive Direct- Director for Marketing and Communications at the Radiological Society of North America. Trained in situational and servant leadership, Jennifer heads multiple departments, a staff of 40, and has led numerous committees and initiatives throughout her career in association management. Her team supports a 20 plus million dollar annual meeting and trade show, customer engagement, marketing, public relations, and member publications. So welcome, Jennifer. I'm so excited to have you as a guest today. Thanks, Sherry. It's always great talking to you. Yeah. So is you have an impressive list of responsibilities, and we go back a long time. Um, so I know a lot about you, but most of our audience t- does not. So tell tell me a little bit more about your background um, and about RSNA. Yeah, so thanks. Well, uh, first of all, just like many people, I did not grow up thinking I want to be an association manager leader. <laughs> I kind of stumbled onto it. So Um, I went into, in college, it was psychology and Spanish. And when I got out of that, I thought about going for a higher degree in in psychology, but I wanted to work in the field a bit. And what I learned when I was working in social work is that what I really enjoyed was putting together programs, evaluating programs, and that type of administrative role. And that's what led me to a master's program at DePaul University for nonprofit management. There is where I bumped into a lot of people who were working in associations. Prior to that, I don't think I could have defined what an association was. So I think it was Susan Darrow that I first kind of bumped into. And at the time she was working at Association Forum, we had, I think it was a statistics class or something together. And so that inspired me to dig into this world of associations. And so when I graduated and wanted to look for work that was more in line with what I had studied, I started with associations. So my first job was with the American College of Foot Surgeons, and I worked in communications. And then my next job was director of communications, and that was with a um, retail dealers association. So I kind of moved out of medical society And I decided that, although I really liked that organization, I was very stimulated by the medical environment, the community, and I really um, liked that commitment to technology and science and just advancing for patients. Um, So I, I looked for a position that would bring me back into the medical realm, and that's when I went to the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, where I was chief communications officer for 13 some years. And most recently, uh, I've been fortunate to land a position at the Radiological Society of North America. And I've been, you know, really excited to lead their marketing communications and some of their new customer engagement initiatives. So really just had a very broad range of experience from smaller associations, you know, 5,000 members to RSNA, which is close to 50,000 members, just, um, really running the gambit. And as you know, there's a difference between a small organization and a larger organization and um, different challenges and, you know, just kind of learning it. But I've really enjoyed my time with RSNA. I've been there now four years. Wow. Time flies. It does, especially when some of those years are a pandemic and it's kind of a blur. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of with the organization that large and, and the role that you have overseeing a team of 40, how has your team worked differently post pandemic? Yeah, so, well, it was interesting. Uh, We were fortunate that prior to the pandemic, we had started to work on some of these project management platforms like Asana and those types of things. So 
it was very interesting when we went remote, we were kind of shocked at how easy it was. We were already doing all of our workflows, you know, in that kind of an environment. So no longer using the paper that people would sign and pass around and all those things. So that was really lucky. And um, I think it just, I would say broadly, organizationally, we were really impressed with how we overnight went to a remote environment, how quickly and easily people picked up all the tools, all the Zooms, all the you know MS Teams and all that really easily and really quickly. And I think... Um, you know, now the challenge that we find is, okay, we survived that, we learned how to do all that, and we have the confidence to know that we are adaptable and flexible, and we can get the work done in a remote world virtually. However, we're realizing that things are, you know, we lost something along the way, right? Right. And so we're trying to figure out how you bring what that was into this virtual environment. And right now, you know, we would describe our organization as a hybrid environment, which is that, you know, there are some people who are fully remote. However, the majority of people um, are kind of hybrid. So they're in the office two days a week and, you know, work from home or wherever the other three days. And so trying to figure out how do you engage with people and connect with people in that kind of a situation? So what we've done in my division is we've made a commitment to Tuesday as uh, a common day. And it's not to say that every person comes in every Tuesday, um, but it's that that's our goal. And we, we come pretty close to hitting that. It gives people an opportunity to have that face time, to have more casual conversations. And I think, you know, what we've learned, the paradox of being so connected digitally in every way, shape and form is that we've lost the human connection. Right. So it's just so strange. Right. And and I think, you know, I heard somebody talk about it once and it just really resonated with me. Um, I think it was at an ASAE, it was a keynote at ASAE and I can't remember her name, but she talked about how um, even though we're connecting more on the digital level, we are not as connected as human beings interpersonally. And part of that is because what happens in an in-person conversation, right? Well, there's a certain level of vulnerability because I don't know what you're going to say and you don't know what I'm going to say, right? And so I have to be able to trust you enough to kind of move forward into that unknown territory, into that conversation. And by being in that moment with you, we are building trust, you know, having conversations and spontaneity and not knowing where things are going that's how you build trust with people. That's how you get chips in the bank, so to speak, with them, right? And so um, we can't edit ourselves in real time when we're having a conversation. You might say something to me that's difficult for me to deal with, and I have to figure out how to process that in the moment. And so um, I think that spontaneity and that in-person kind of situation, those conversations that you have in the hallway, you know, in the kitchen and all those things, they help you build relationships and relationships come in handy when you have to deal with the difficult stuff, right? Um, When you have to have the difficult conversations, it's good that you have a baseline with somebody. Um, And I think about the fact that RSNA is a large organization. I don't know if we're at 250 or 260. We're somewhere in there. A third of our staff was hired during the pandemic. Wow. So you can imagine what it's like for those folks to try to establish connections and understand all the pieces and connect the dots That's incredible. So that's something that we've really looked at as an organization of how do you help these people on board? And we're getting pretty good at it. Um, So I'm pretty proud of that attention that we've had to that. But everything has changed, as you know. And so we've been talking lately about how do you bring that in-person touch to a virtual world? When we first went down that pandemic road, we heard about Zoom fatigue. So what did we do? 
We got on those calls. We got right down to business. Don't waste people's time. They're tired of Zoom. They're tired of Teams. You know, just get the work done. Well, we checked the boxes. We got the work done. We did the transactions. And, you know, something's missing, right? So now we're taking a different approach of, hey, give people space and time to connect on calls. You know, give people time to catch up. Don't feel like we're wasting people's time. Let them establish that connection, whether they're in a virtual environment or whether they're in person. You know, and it's so funny too, just because I think about my early days in the workforce and you'd get the side eye from your boss if you were talking to somebody for too long, right? It was like, you're wasting our time. You're on company time. This isn't about, you know, your dog or whatever it is. And now we actually find that we want people to enjoy work. We want people to enjoy their coworkers and their teams. We spend a lot of time at work. So we want to create that positive environment and that positive culture. So now when I see people, you know, talking, I might join in. I might say, hey, you know, um, it's just a very different feel and and our goals are different and what we've learned we I, I would I'm happy to say that we've evolved right as as a society and as a workforce yeah I think it'll be very interesting too because I'm hearing as you know my daughter's graduating um, from mm-hmm. college this year and the, they're actually having discussions about applying for jobs and making sure that they are jobs that are in the office Um So I think that that's something else that we need to start considering as we move forward, you know, organizations like what does that new workforce, because they lived, they went, you know, 100, obviously, like, you know, with schools, virtual, and they know what they missed, they know what they missed from an education standpoint. So they're like, how can I learn this new job in a remote environment? So I think it's being very intentional about that you know, kind of as we move along, I don't know what the answer is, but I think that's going to be another challenge that we're going to have to, to think about, um, you know, and, and, and for, us, especially like for them, they're having conversations. Like if it's a remote job, unlike us, right. We're like, Oh, remote job. Great. We want that one. <laughs> you're like remote job. Nope. Don't want it. So it's just interesting. <laughs> like when you talk about generational gaps too, right. Where that's, major, major difference in, uh, in attitude. Right. And, you know, you hear, and it's funny because I used to think that it was the attitudes were very defined generationally and post pandemic. I don't think that's necessarily as true. Um, now it may be for, for kids that went through school in a pandemic, that's going to be a whole different thing, like you said, but I'm seeing that people across generations kind of want the same thing in terms of they still want flexibility. You know, they're, yeah. they're going to want flexibility. That's not going away. Let's right. face it. You know, we have to understand that people come to work as whole human beings with a lot of complexity and we have to kind of understand that. Right. Um, but I think we're going to be studying the impact of all of this for decades. It's just, it's absolutely fascinating. And it's, it's, it's interesting to hear that people in college are looking for in-person situations and, you know, Hey, if they go to work and nobody else is there, that's gonna, (laughs) they're not going to like that. So we do have to think about that generation for sure. another, Another thing I heard from somebody, which made a lot of sense, you know, you get out of college and you, um, go live in an apartment with like a small apartment with four other people. Well, they don't want to be working there all day and right. being there all day. So I know some associations started just opening up their offices for people like them who just wanted another space to work. So it is, I think it'll be, yeah, navigating this over the next um, couple of years will be yeah, fascinating. And, you know, RSNA, we have a beautiful building and, you know, it's wonderful. We have a very comfortable, great place to work. So I think we're lucky because we can offer people whatever they want. There are some people who come in more than two days a week for sure, just because they like that structure and that environment. Yeah. Um, but in my department, you know, setting Tuesday as a day was my 
you know, way of making sure people could feel the benefit of being together, you know, because if yeah. you're going two days a week and you don't bump into people, what's the right? Point? What's the point? Right. What's the point? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Jennifer, you know, a compelling mission and strong values are among the strategies that promote enthusiasm and improve communications. So how does RSNA value the impact the organization's um, daily activities? Yeah, so I think, first of all, let me start by saying I'm pretty lucky because the backdrop of RSNA that it offers as a culture, it has a very strong, welcoming environment. And I think it's pretty remarkable because it's such a large organization. You would think maybe that the culture would be a little bit um, less tangible, but actually, when you ask people, what do you like about RSNA? It's always, it's the people. It's just a yeah. great environment. People love it. So that is really remarkable, I think, for an organization that size. Um, and I will say that, you know, from a values perspective, we have been, you know, valuing flexibility, transparency, you know, all the things that people really want to feel um, connected and proud to be a part of the organization. I think, you know, from our commitment to patients and how we help our members in their commitment to patients, I think that's something that really people feel proud to be a part of. And then also, you know, it's interesting, our commitment to diversity and inclusion, we've got it on multiple fronts, whether it be um, our health equity commitment on the patient side, programs toward that, or um, even the pipeline issues that we have in terms of, you know, how do you make sure that the pipeline of radiologists and medical physicists in that world, you know, welcome diversity and encourage diversity. So we've got it, you know, we're hitting diversity and inclusion on all fronts, internally on staff, you know, on conscious bias training and all these different programs that we're doing. And I think that that helps people, um, you know, really feel that they can commit to the work and feel like they're okay, given their loyalty to RSNA, because they can feel proud of the work that we're doing. And I think that that impacts your daily life. But like I said, I was really pleasantly impressed when I started with RSNA to just see that environment with such a large organization. I thought for sure, you know, large organization, nobody's going to know yeah. who I am. They're not, not going to know each other. It's just going to be kind of cold. That's not at all what I feel. And, you know, again, that, that commitment to transparency, we, especially with the pandemic, um, our commitment to communicating often and as transparently as possible, I think we've really increased our efforts as most organizations should. But, you know, if you go to any, if you survey 100 companies and you ask their employees, you know, what are the problems here? You're going to hear communication. You're going to hear silos. You're going to hear all yeah. those things. So, you know, it's, it's an ongoing effort for every organization to commit to those things. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about um, values and, and missions a little bit. Uh, so, you know, marketing teams usually play an important role in helping departments across the organization be aware of values and, and mission. So what are some strategies that you guys use to put everybody on the same page? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because the marketing and communication teams have such an amazing opportunity. You know, we we know a little bit about everything, right? And right. so uh, we see our perspective is very different too, but um, our influence is there. And so that that's an amazing opportunity to have to support our mission, mission to support the values, and even to support and sustain RSNA in motion in real time to help keep everybody connected we can help connect the dots for people. And so that's a really powerful thing um, to do in real time. But I think the way we do it is, you know, from developing a lot of different content pieces from our content mm -hmm. strategy, developing key messages, 
FAQs, um, the way we share important stories within the field, uh, the publications that we work on, you know, all of those pieces that reflect RSNA values, we have an impact and we can influence those stories and that information that goes out to our constituents and to the public. Um, I also think visually we have opportunities. So we have our, you know, creative teams um, selecting imagery or creating, you know, different artwork that exemplifies our values and just keeping an eye on diversity and making sure that everything reflects our community and the diversity of our community. And we've made a real commitment to offering a welcoming environment, both on staff, but even RSNA as an organization to our members and to the community at large. So just making sure that visually we're reflecting that welcoming environment, I think is really important. And then in the daily, we reinforce it every day through planning meetings with, you know, the business units and just making sure that they're connected and aligned with what is what matters to the organization, because their job at the business unit is to go deep, you know, on whatever their content right. is, on whatever their program is. So we have an opportunity to keep them connected to the movement and the bigger, you know, um, pieces that are going on at the organizational level. So I've always told my team, you know, we're very privileged because we know a lot about the organization and we can help keep people on track in real time. So talk to me a little bit, Jennifer, about, you know, what do you see are some of the challenges working in a large association? So you've, yeah. worked, you've worked at small, <laughs> medium, you've, you've been all, all over. So I'm just interested in what, what you see as kind of some of the challenges. Right. So it's interesting because not only is RSNA a large organization, but it represents a very large field, which, you know, right. makes sense, right? You know, the, the bigger the field, kind of the larger the organization. So I would say that getting wrapping your arms around the field and the organization, I mean, the learning curve is far and wide, right? Um, trying to become at least superficially proficient in the language of the field, you know, making sure that when you talk to your volunteers, you at least have some level of knowledge that, you know, you understand that an apple is an apple and an orange is an orange and, you know, some of those high level differences. So the language of the field and then understanding and learning the structure of the organization, right? Because even though all associations kind of have some of those main structures, like you might have the finance department, the membership department, the education department. We're all going to have something like that. But organizations are complex. They evolve over time and the work parses out differently. There are nuances. And so in a larger organization, the extent to which those nuances happen are just, you know, exponentially more complex. And so you might have a lot of hyper specialization, right? And instead of people wearing a lot of different hats, you will have very um, expert specialists in certain areas of your organization. And so trying to understand who does what, like who really does what, yeah. you know, and, and asking those questions, who do I go to for this? I mean, it, it, it can be a mystery. So I really feel for people who onboarded during the pandemic because as as good of a job we do with onboarding and training and development, and even at the departmental level, the reality is we learn over time and we learn as we bump into things and physical space is a part of that learning, right? You can think about, oh, where was I when that person said that? Okay, I was in this room. So it must've been that meeting, you know, or um, gee, I know that that person's office is over here and that means that they work with this department, you know, so um, it can be a real challenge, but, but yes, any um, large organization offers a larger structure and it's just kind of more to learn. And I would say radiology in particular as a specialty has a lot of subspecialties. And so that becomes just really when you think about knowledge management and taxonomy and all those different pieces and who are we serving and your audience, it's complex. So it's kind of a different um, topic. The 
I'm hearing a lot about from different various um, healthcare organizations about disruption in the healthcare industry and and how it's impacting their members. Um, is there disruption um, for the RSNA members in the healthcare industry? And if so, what are you guys doing to help mitigate those difficulties? Yeah, so, well, the pandemic has really impacted healthcare, as we know. And I mean, it's impacted everybody, right? But healthcare in particular, while the rest of the world kind of, you know, hit the pause button or shut down or went virtual, healthcare workers uh, weren't able to go virtual in that same way. Yeah. In radiology, they were, however, so a lot of them, you know, were able to do readings virtually. So that was kind of nice because that had already been in motion, some of that type of work, uh, remote remote reads and whatnot. So, um, but prior to the pandemic too, we knew that healthcare reform and some of the business economic factors of healthcare just are a major stress stressor on the field. And so then you add that layer of pandemic. And I think what we're hearing, unfortunately, it's it's just, it's really tough. I think healthcare providers, whether, you know, physicians, nurses, anyone in a healthcare environment is really stressed. And yeah. I think the hard part is that you can you know, you can throw all the wellness tools at them that you want, you know, give them yoga, mindfulness, all these different things that we try to give people as tools to take individual responsibility for how they're feeling. The reality is we've got some very large systemic problems that need to be fixed. And I think a lot of people went into healthcare with the thought of wanting to help people. And so when, you know, there, there's a business opportunity in healthcare, right? And so when right. the focus becomes all about profitability and the bottom line, those people who went into it with an individual mission to help people, they're not inspired anymore, especially when you go through pandemic and, you know, they're kind of mistreated, they're overworked, they're understaffed. Yeah. I mean, I think that that is a crisis. I think it's hit a crisis level, not just for radiology. I think for every specialty um, within healthcare. Yeah. So recovering from the pandemic and figuring out how to move forward in a way that's positive, um, but also sustainable for from a business standpoint, I think I think it's really tough. And so, you know, what have we done as RSNA? What can we do? Well, we look at our influence. How can we give our members tools for influence, you know, professional development, leadership skills. How can we, you know, a lot of healthcare providers did not have any sort of leadership training or right. administrative training within medical school. So really trying to help them on some of those other things that will help them be more influential within their institutions. That's really where the opportunity is. And also, as you know, associations can bring people together for networking, connecting around these yeah. topics. And boy, you bring people together and you can hear it. They are just what's going on. And, you know, you, yeah. how are you dealing with this? How are you dealing with this? It's that's really where the power is for associations is to bring people from different institutions together to say, how are we solving these problems? Yeah, that's great. So just to add on to that, what do you feel are RSNA's biggest opportunities for the future? Yeah, well, we have a lot. I mean, I would say something that is really big in our field right now is AI, right? And so um, artificial intelligence can bring a lot to radiology by improving efficiencies and workflows and really speeding up the work that doesn't require human uh, adjudication, human discernment, that kind of thing. And yet, you know, there's still a little bit of trepidation, right, within the field of, well, if AI handles this, what do I handle, right? And so I think people have finally 
uh, turn the corner on that and realize that there's a great opportunity to leverage AI so that they could be, spend their time on the work that does require that human interaction and that discernment. So I think that AI represents an opportunity from that perspective, but also the larger opportunity for RSNA at our level is um, not just how do we, you know, educate and help people at the individual level with the AI, but also for the field. How do we ensure that AI is leveraged and brought to the table and implemented in a way that offers safety and quality for patients, right? And so um, these are the things that we work on, whether it be through task forces, partnerships, you know, how do we move forward to leverage AI in a way that is safe and in the best interest of our patients. And I think that that's the larger play for RSNA, but we definitely are also working at the individual level with our members. And so how would you advise association leaders to use technology to advance their goals? Yeah, so I think um, when you think about technology, mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, we always focus on the tools first. Right, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm always like, okay, let's step back and say, what are we trying to do here? And so, you know, I think what's different now is the velocity of change um, for everybody, every field, yeah. you know. And so, so it's the velocity of change and it's the unknown future. Those are the things that we're really struggling with, right? Um we don't have as long of a runway when we look at future planning, right? We, we just, it's like, you know, you're just kind of gearing up toward what you don't quite know, you know what the trends are, but it's very hard to see. I think about, I think about teachers, you know, it's an analogy, like teachers used to know that they were preparing students for maybe to become a teacher, maybe to become a doctor, maybe a lawyer, maybe this, maybe that. We knew what the professions were going to be, right? And today we don't really know what the future professions are. And so I think two things, the velocity and the uncertainty are real challenges. And so when you look at technology, what does it need to do for us? Um, as associations, we used to say, what do we provide members, right? And now we are challenged to say, how, how? do we provide mm -hmm. it? It's all in the delivery, right? And it's that yeah, that's, speed. It's a good so, quote. I'm going to steal that from you. Okay, do it, do it. Yeah, so it's not just the why, it's the yeah. how, right? And Or the, not just the what, but the, but the how, right? And so um, I think that's the issue. So when you look at technology, you're really kind of thinking, how does this give us an advantage in terms of gaining speed, right? How does it remove silly obstacles? So automation and, you know, things that are redundant and things that are a lot of busy work. Your staff doesn't want to do it, right? And they get frustrated by it. They were, they want to be thinking. They were hired to, you know, use their brain and yet they're kind of They've got some of the busy work. So anything where you can look at technology in terms of gaining speed and reducing some of those obstacles, I think is really important. And so even looking at the higher, the higher level of knowledge management, um, information management. So how do you make a commitment organizationally to classifying your content and knowing what those buckets are and what fits in what and how do you connect those dots behind the scenes digitally you know how do you the taxonomies how do you pull it all together so that you can help these systems serve members 24 7 online at their convenience and in a way that's smart okay you liked this? All right. Well, we saw that you liked this. So we know that you're really going to like that. So really looking at things that can make those associations and connect those dots behind the scenes, I think is really powerful as well. So what other advice would you give association leaders for success over the next couple of years? Stay flexible, right? <laughs> um, um, I think you know, if you were to ask a second grader, they're now learning about growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so true, right? Um, think about yourself 
it, think about what we're asking of our staffs, right? We're asking our staff to be hired for one job description and probably changing pretty significantly over the course of even five years, right? And so keeping in mind that part, one really important role we have is helping manage change and helping our teams adapt to change and helping them, you know, embrace that growth mindset. And some of them have it and some of them, you know, aren't in that space, right? And so that's kind of a challenge as a leader. I also think that at the end of the day, uh, no matter what happens, right, you're the grounding force, right? And so you have to figure out, like, how do I steady the course for my team to the extent possible? How do we focus on the things that we can control? Um, how do we, you know, look at and keep an eye on our future? And also, you know, let's talk about even just morale at the individual level for employees, right? So I'm of the thought that most employees come to work wanting to succeed, right? But what happens when they don't have the tools? What happens when they have all these obstacles? It's frustrating. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important part of, you know, what is your role as a leader? It's to help your team succeed, to give them the tools that they need to succeed, to remove the barriers. And so in that vein, you have to be cognizant as a leader every day, every conversation you have, that's your job is to remove those barriers and give them the tools. And that can be hard too, right? Because um, it's not the sky's the limit for us either. We have to work within certain constraints and parameters. So get creative, um, help your team problem solve, be a partner with your team when they're having obstacles and, um, you know, be ready to roll up your sleeves. You know, you're working at all different levels at the macro and the micro. You've got to be able to go back and forth between those pieces every time and and be that conduit between big picture and the daily work that's going on. Help them understand how their daily activities and their work and their projects connect to the bigger picture, right? Because everybody's looking for a little bit of meaning and purpose in what they're doing. Yeah, to, to um, your point about having the right tools really resonated with me. We had a client that called me um, that wanted, they needed new technologies, um, new AMS, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So then they got in a situation where people were quitting and then he kept calling me. He's like, we really need to do this, but now I don't have the people. So it got to the point that he called me and said, I don't have any choice, but just to make this happen because everybody's quitting because of the inefficiencies and in the tools. And they're so frustrated and they were just frustrated on not being able to, to do their job. Um, and so anyway, I think that's something that, that you don't, don't always think is top of mind, but those kind of like those quiet frustrations that's going on with staff of, okay, it just took me three hours to do this because I don't have the right tools and this should take 15 minutes or whatever the case might be. So that was a really good, that was a, that was yes. a good, something to really think about, be top well, and, of mind too. And that brings up a great point of making sure that you're actively listening and trying to figure out, you know, what is in their way, because, you know, at a certain level, people aren't going to knock on my door and say, Jennifer, I want to talk to you about a problem that I'm having, right? You yeah. know, I might not find out about it until it's reached a, a boiling point. So, you know, really trying to work hard to have that open door policy and engaging people in those conversations that you can understand what's really going on. What are they really dealing with? I think that's critical. Yeah. And you've always been great at, at doing that. Um, so I'm interested to know who are the leaders that you most admire and why? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I would say, um, of course, I spent a lot of time at the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy with Pat Blake. Yeah. So, um, of course, I would say Pat Blake, she's somebody who uh, I think, you know, gave me a chance early on in my career to be at the at the C-suite. And um, I learned a lot from her about just your approach to people management I think the reality is people don't always understand this at certain parts in your career that 
the further up you go, the less it's about the stuff that you do and the more it's about people management. So you really, you know, if you're trying to advance your career, make sure that you're focusing on those people management pieces. And I think I learned a lot from her about that. I learned a lot from her about uh, volunteer interaction and how do you manage volunteers and delicate conversations and, um, you know, just all those dynamics at the board level. So I think I really appreciate my time with her. I think early on, like I mentioned, Susan Darrow was uh, phenomenal. It kind of reminds me, I need to reach out to her and see how she's <laughs> doing. She went to the for-profit. She, she became a consultant at some point, um, I think down in Florida, and I lost contact with her. But Susan Darrow just really helped open my eyes to associations and the power of associations. So that's been phenomenal. I would say you, you're somebody I really yeah. look up to because um, you just have that wonderful balance of drive and, you know, personal, ba- you know, work-life balance in terms of um, being able to juggle it all. I think you understand that that takes kind of an everyday thing. There is no such thing as work-life balance, right? Sometimes you just have to get the work done and you have to prioritize within your life, right? And so it's more about integration. And I think you do a really good job of integrating. And I've always seen you as a strong association leader. We started out both in association, yeah. although in a little bit of a different situation when you were on with the uh, net online. That's right. Was... <laughs> Crazy here. Start a business for us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's been a, it's yeah. been a long journey, but. Well, thanks, Jennifer. I think that is one of the things I think that I love most about, or at least with my career and your career with associations, it was like, people gave us chances, right? I felt like if if you look back, it was like, I was a kid, I had no idea what I was doing. But um, and people probably don't know him now, because he's been retired for so long. But Brad Claxton, who I worked for, I said, Brad, what if he was a CEO at at the dermatologist? And I was like, Brad, what if this doesn't work out? What if I can't do this? He's like, no, don't worry about it. We'll find you another job here. I was like, (laughs) Oh, all right. Well, I had worked at Panasonic was my first job out of school. They would have been like, because you're going to be fired and out the door. Yes. So I think it's it's that too. Like when you talk about Pat and Susan and Brad and all the people along along the way, like that's been, I think, one of the things that 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 I've loved most in having this career. Um, I agree. I agree. It's like those people that will have your back and they will let you take a calculated risk. And they'll catch you if you fall, like they will help you. And so I always think about that myself with helping other people is just kind of making sure that they understand that, you know, it's okay to fail. It's okay to not, you know, have a 100% perfect situation. We're going to learn from it and we're going to move on. And so I think um, all those people that mentored me have really changed the way I look at when I'm helping other people too. That's great. So one really quick last question I have for you today. I could probably, I could talk to you all day. I always can. Um, (laughs) So how do you advance your professional expertise? Yeah, let's say, okay, before COVID, um, no, I'm just kidding, (laughs) but, but really the COVID years have been kind of difficult. I think trying to stay connected, um, it's hard because we're all time starved, right? And so the fastest way is to stay connected with your networks, right? Um, Whether it be in these leadership circles that you have, uh, whether it be at, you know, small conferences, local conferences, I really think that those in-person conversations are so important. And then they allow you to call somebody later and say, hey, I was really interested in what you said about that. Could you connect me to the right person? Um, that's invaluable, right? Because it's yeah. so much better than cold calling somebody and saying, you know, I lead this at this organization. You don't know me, but could you give me some, you know, possibly proprietary information on how you deal with X? You know, but it's really nice when one of their coworkers said, hey, I met Jennifer and she might be calling you about this. It just kind of opens that door. So I think the networking is key, whether you find ways to do that in person or even virtually, that's really key. Trying to stay, um, you know, trying to find some sort of cadence of what you read and and uh, all the publications that are in the industry. 
finding, you know, sometimes I, I switch off on um, annual conferences so that I can do both general association management. And then sometimes I'll do marketing communication type focus things to stay on top of those trends as well. So reaching out, find a mentor, you know, see if, you know, if you don't have one, find somebody. I think um, in my career I've done, I've done executive coaching, which has been really insightful, um, you know, and just kind of understanding about myself and what do I want to be as a leader? What do I bring to the table? So seek out those opportunities. And most importantly, make sure you're paying attention to your career, right? It's very easy to get swallowed up in the daily activities, um, but be intentional. You know, start your year out with some professional goals. What am I trying to do? There may be ones that you say, okay, okay, here, boss, here are my professional goals. But, you know, think about it as a person, as a person, as an individual contributor, what you want to bring into the world, what kind of career you want to have. Think about those questions and figure out what is it going to take to get there. And then, of course, there's always that wonderful, uh, wonderful strategy of looking at somebody you admire and trying to understand the steps. What what did it take for them to get there? And reach out to them. Don't be afraid to reach out and say, "I really admire you. I've you know been watching your career. I see what you've done. Very impressive. Wondering if you had a few minutes to talk to me about that." And I I have found people to be very helpful, particularly in the association space. Yeah, well, um, I'll do a little plug and say that, you know, people want to meet leaders like you, that they should consider joining .org communities. So, and we've tried to create very collaborative um, events. This one's going to be even more so because I think what we hear from people is that's what they want. They want those connections that they can walk away with in six months from now be like, oh, it might be something simple or like, Jennifer, what email marketing tools do you guys use? Do you like them? Do you not like them? Whatever. Like just to kind of like help quickly get the jobs done or there may be bigger problems. And how are you guys wrestling with with issues of culture and work life balance or some of those things? So that'd be that's great. But well, thanks. I'm already registered, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks for the great advice today. Um, and thanks to our listeners. I hope you guys enjoyed this um, episode of our podcast. And if somebody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? You can email me, jmahalik at rsna.org. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. It's a lot of different ways. Great. Well, great. Well, I appreciate your time. I know you are really busy and I, uh, I'm grateful that you have shared with us today your insights and knowledge and advice. Well, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Sherry. Thanks so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode and discovered tips and information that will add value to your leadership style and your association. Org Source specializes in positioning teams for success with solutions for technology, strategy, and marketing. Please contact us at info at orgsource.com or visit www.orgsource.com to find out how to keep your organization on track to Association 4.0.